A few years ago, I made a video on something called the Frulani integral, and today I'd like to look at a generalization of that integral and then a nice application of that generalization. So let's recall that the Frulani integral is the integral from zero to infinity of f of a of x minus f of b of x over x dx. And the result says that that is equal to f of zero minus f of infinity times the natural log of b over a. But what do we mean by f of infinity? Well, that's an important question. So f of infinity is defined to be the limit as c goes to infinity of f of c if f is not periodic and it's equal to one over p times the integral from zero to p of f of x dx if f is periodic and has period p. So what I mean by f of infinity is defined to be that, I mean, well, in the setting of this integral. So this left-hand side is equal to this right-hand side where we take f of infinity to be one of those depending on the situation. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna look at a generalization of this integral, so it's gonna look like this. We've got the integral from zero to infinity, c1 f of a1x plus, well, next will be c2 f of a2x added all the way up to ending at cn f of a n x over x. And finally, we need this condition that the sum of the coefficients c1 plus c2 up to cn is equal to zero. Well, notice that's exactly what we have going on here. It's just that we only have two terms and our c1 and c2 are one and negative one. So this is a true generalization of that. Okay, so the strategy here will be to decompose this new integral into a bunch of copies of the Frulani integral, which like I said before, I've got an old video on if you'd like to check that out. Okay, so let's get going with this expansion. So let's bring this integral down. We have the integral from zero to infinity. And then let's just start with our c1 f of a 1x. But in order to use our Frulani integral, we need the same coefficient attached to another f of a something x. Well, we might as well use f of a 2x. So we'll have minus c1 f of a 2x. So now just stopping right there, well, if we put that over x, we're able to use this result over here. But we're not done because we've still got a lot left over in the numerator here. And not only do we have a lot left over in the numerator, but we've just like subtracted off a term which is, does not exist up there. This minus c1 f of a2x is not up here. But that means we need to add it back in. But then we can attach the added back in with the coefficient that is attached to the f of a2x, and that'll be something like this. So we'll have plus c1 plus c2 f of a2x. But now we'd like to subtract off something with the same coefficient, but maybe a different argument of f. So perhaps the next one. So that'll be minus c1 plus c2 f of a 3x. Okay, so let's maybe do some grouping on that as well. But notice that this minus c1 minus c2 times f of a 3x does not exist up here. That means we need to add it back in. But then that process is gonna continue on and on and on until we end up at the very end. And the very last term, will look like this. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and factor something out because it's pretty clear that we can factor something out of all of these. Okay, so for the last term, we'll be able to factor out a C1 added up to Cn minus one, and then that's gonna be attached to F evaluated at An minus one X minus F evaluated at An X. And then let's do some grouping on that as well. And then this is all over our denominator of x. And then I can't really fit my, well, maybe I can fit my dx in. So that's right there. Oh, but if we look at this, this stuff in magenta parentheses, well, that's exactly c1 times a certain like simple Frulani integral. 
and the stuff inside the blue parentheses is C1 plus C2 times a certain Frulani integral and so on and so forth. Oh, and I forgot my dot, dot, dots here. So I should have dot, 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 and then this has addition on either side. Okay, so that means we can apply this rule over here to all of that. So let's maybe go, go ahead and color code. So let's see, from these magenta parentheses, we'll have a C1, and then we'll have f of zero minus f of infinity. And then next we'll have the natural log of a2 over a1. So again, that's just from a direct application of what we started with. And then let's see what we get for those blue parentheses. So that'll have a c1 plus c2 out front. So let's bring that out. And then we'll have another f0 minus f of infinity. And then we'll have a natural log of a3 over a2. Great, and then that kind of thing is gonna continue on and on and on until we end up at this c1 added up to cn minus one. And then we'll have another f of zero minus f of infinity and then a natural log of a n over a n minus one. Okay, then that was in our green parentheses. Okay, good. And then next up, we'll note that there is a factor of f of zero minus f of infinity attached to all of these. I'll factor that out, and then I'll gather all of the coefficients of c1, all of the coefficients of c2, and so on and so forth. So that's gonna give me this like I said, this f of zero minus f of infinity factored out. And then after that, well, let's put a big set of parentheses here. And what will we have attached to C1? Well, in fact, C1 is attached to a bunch of stuff. It's attached to all of these logarithm terms. So we'll have this first one, natural log of A2 over A1, but I'm gonna expand that out using logarithm rules. That'll be the natural log of a2 minus the natural log of a1. Then the next one will be plus the natural log of a3 minus the natural log of a2 added all the way up to this last one, which is the natural log of a n minus the natural log of a n minus one. Okay, great. So like I said, that's attached to our c1 term. And now let's see what's attached to our c2 term. So C2 is gonna capture everything from this blue parentheses to the right. Notice there's no C2 in this first one. So I'll have natural log of A3 minus natural log of A2. And then the next one will be plus natural log of A4 minus natural log of A3 ended all the way out here at the natural log of AN minus the natural log of AN minus one. Great. And then that's gonna be added all the way up to my cn minus one term. And so my cn minus one term is simply attached to the natural log of a n minus the natural log of a n minus one. Great. And that's what we have all multiplied by this f zero minus f infinity. But let's see if we can simplify that and we can actually simplify that pretty easily. So notice we get a big collapse here. We'll have the natural log of a2 cancels this natural log of a2. Natural log of a3 will cancel the something that's coming down the line. And this natural log of an minus one will cancel something that came before. So this first term will simplify down to, let's see, it'll be something like natural log of a n minus natural log of a one. Okay, so that's for that first term. And then likewise, the second term will get a lot of cancellation too. So this natural log of a three will cancel the one coming down all the way up, that'll cancel that and so on and so forth. And here we'll be left with, let's see, it'll be natural log of a n minus natural log of a two, something like that. So now I think we can see some structure. C one is attached to this difference of the natural log of a n and the natural log of a one. C two is attached to the difference of the natural log of a n and the natural log of a two. C 
C3 will be attached to the difference in the natural log of An and natural log of A3. All the way down, Cn minus 1 is attached to a similar difference. So now let's rewrite that so that we see everything as a coefficient of the natural log of A sub K, for instance. So let's maybe do that right here. Okay, so this is what we ended up on the last board. We had this f of zero minus f of infinity, and then the following expansion of these natural log terms. The interesting thing is what's happening at the very end. We've got this c1 added all the way up to cn minus one attached to the natural log of an. That seems to not follow this pattern. But in fact, it does follow that, this pattern because since the sum is equal to zero, we know that the sum from C1 to Cn minus one is simply minus Cn. But now we can maybe factor a minus sign out of that and have this switch the order of subtraction here. And we'll be left with F of infinity minus F of zero. And then this nice sum, which is C1 natural log of A1 added all the way up to Cn natural log of An. Great, and that'll be the rule that we use for this generalized fruit law in the integral to evaluate our goal. Okay, so let's get to that. Okay, so we got our little generalized Frulani integral on the board, and now we're ready to evaluate our goal, and we're gonna start off with a round of integration by parts. And in fact, we're gonna use integration by parts a few times here. So this first one will take our u to be equal to the sine to the fifth power of x, and then we'll take our dv to be dx over x to the fifth. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. So taking the derivative, we have du is equal to five sine to the fourth x times cosine of x dx. That's of course using the chain rule. Then taking the antiderivative, we'll see that v is equal to well, it'll be negative one over three times one over x cubed. Okay, so I think that'll do it. So let's put a nice box around that and see where this first round of integration by parts takes us. So using the standard formula, which is u times v minus uh, v du, what'll that leave us with? So we'll have minus one third and then we'll have sine to the fifth x over x cubed. And then the minus sign in the integration by parts formula and the minus sign here will cancel. I'll bring the third out. So we have plus one third. Oh, and I'll bring a five out two from this du. And then we'll have the integral from zero up to infinity of sine four x cosine x over x cubed dx. So we're left with something like that. Oh, and I forgot this should be evaluated from zero to infinity. So let's notice as x approaches infinity, the denominator is definitely going to kill out the numerator. And then as x approaches zero, well, that's a standard trigonometric lim limit. Notice that sine cubed over x cubed will be one, but we've got an extra sine squared in the numerator, meaning that in the end we get zero. So putting those two facts together, this bit right here is simply equal to zero. And that leaves us with another integral. And how are we gonna attack that other integral? Well, it's gonna be another round of integration by parts. So let's see. And we'll use a similar choice of u and dv. So let's take our u here to be the trig function. So that'll be sine to the fourth x times cosine of x. That makes du using the product rule and the chain rule. Let's see, it'll be four sine cubed x cosine squared x minus sine to the fifth x dx. And then let's see, our v will be equal to dx over x cubed, which means our, sorry, our dv will be that, which means our v will be minus one half one over x squared. Okay. So there's our setup for our second round of integration by parts. And now let's see what that leaves us with. Again, the standard integration by parts formula, we'll have u times v minus the integral of v du. So that'll be minus one half, and then we'll have 
sine to the fourth x times cosine of x over x squared. And then we'll have a plus, well, one half times this five thirds. Oh, I forgot to bring this five thirds through. So that's really minus five six. So that'll be plus five over six. And then the integral from zero to infinity of, well, like I said, it will be v du. So that'll be four sine cubed x times cosine squared x minus sine to the fifth x all over x squared dx. And then for similar reasons to this evaluation being zero, this second evaluation is also equal to zero. And now, well, essentially you're gonna do another round of integration by parts. Maybe I won't work through the details there because it's a little bit gnarly taking the derivative and combining all of the terms. I'll just write what we get in the end. So in the end, we'll have this is equal to five over six. And like I said, this is from another round of integration by parts. The integral from zero to infinity of 12 times sine squared x times cosine cubed x minus 13 sine fourth x cosine x. And then this is all over x dx. But now we're kind of in the right situation. We've got something over x. Perhaps we can manipulate this so it looks like one of these Frulani integrals. And we can, and it's going to be by using some power reducing formulas for trig functions. So upon using those power reducing formulas for trig functions on these two objects here, we'll have the following expression. We'll have five over 96, and then the integral from zero up to infinity of, so we'll have minus two times cosine of x, and then plus 27 times cosine of three x, and then minus 25 cosine of seven x all over x. And I don't have room for my dx, but that's okay. But now that satisfies this rule over here exactly. Notice our coefficients add to zero, and then we've got these different values of a. So our a1 is like one, our a2 is three, and our a3 is seven. So now we can directly apply this. Using the fact that in this setup, since our function is the cosine function, our f of infinity is zero. That's based off of that periodic version of the f of infinity. I'll let you guys check that. So this is gonna leave us the following number. So we'll have five over 96, and then we'll have minus two times the natural log of one, and then plus 27 times the natural log of three, and then minus 25 times the natural log of five. But of course the natural log of one is equal to zero, so that disappears, and that gives us our final answer. So we've got this five over 96 times 27 natural log of three minus 25 natural log of five. So there we've done it. Using all of these tricks, we've evaluated this pretty interesting integral. Now, of course, this relied on the fact that in the end, we got down to all cosines and coefficients that added up to zero. So my question for you is, when does that happen? In other words, when could we start with a power of sine in the numerator and we end up with all cosines after repeated integration by parts and the coefficients adding to zero? And anytime that's the case, we can use this kind of trick to evaluate this kind of integral. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.